wonderful attendees here at Resolution Foundation and also to our participants online. I'm just going so to check we're all linked in online. I think we are fantastic. So welcome to our online participants as well. Um, my name is David Willits, uh, President of the Resolution Foundation and Chair of the Foundation for Science and Technology. So it seemed quite a good idea to get the two different uh, think tanks, if you like, working together on this really important topic of exactly what we are spending, how much we are spending on R&D and getting beyond the inputs to the outputs of what its economic impact is. And I'm delighted that we have been able to bring these two great organisations together. I'm grateful to Gavin Costigan and the team at the Foundation for Science and Technology and of course to Torsten Bell and the team here at Resolution Foundation. Uh, so, in a way, as this is the Resolution Foundation and not the distinguished surroundings of the Royal Society, a particular welcome to FST here physically to the offices of the Resolution Foundation. Our, our offices, our main offices, I still think of the time when I was first involved in think tanks running the Centre for Policy Studies back in the 1980s when we, from a small Georgian house near here and when we had a Chinese delegation who visited us to describe what sounded a lot like capitalism, but which they assured me was the Chinese road to socialism. And as they, as they left our little Georgian house, they said to me, and I hope next time we can visit your headquarters. Uh, <laughs> so uh, so I, I kept a straight face there, absolutely. Um, anyway, so here you are at our headquarters of Resolution Foundation. Uh, and we're going to hear, first of all, from Grant Fitzner, who is the the ideal expert to explain to us, uh, coming from the I ONS, uh, he's going to, as chief economist, uh, we, he's going to explain to us kind of the inputs, the, exactly what we do know about the R&D data. Uh, and of course, there's been this fascinating and important uh, new estimate earlier this year from the ONS of R&D spend. And he may perhaps stray into whether the HMRC investigation as to whether or not R&D tax credits for SMEs are being abused or not is a relevant consideration for the, his future measurement of this data or not. And then we're going to uh, range uh, quite widely into the outputs and I will introduce in a moment Jonathan Haskell and then we'll hear from Dame Otlin Liza. But Grant, over to you, why don't you set the ball rolling? Here we go. Um, thank you, David, and welcome, everyone. And uh, I, uh, I'm strenuously trying to forward death by PowerPoint, so you'll be relieved to know that the fairly long slide deck my colleagues provided has been trimmed back a little bit to really just give you an edit of highlights of the journey the ONS has been on the last few years. Um, I mean, I think the, the, the main point of interest for many of you is the significant upward revision to our R&D estimates more recently, but just really want to unpack what, what the motivation for that was, uh, what we've done so far, uh, and what we're going to be doing as next steps. Uh, but I'm sure the conversation we'll ride will uh, broaden much beyond that this evening. So let's just start with um, what we've done. So breaking this into, into the individual categories, business, higher education, uh, government, R&D. Worth making the point that business R&D is about 70% of total research and development in the UK. Higher education, I think, is around 23%, government, five, and the remainder is non-profit. So business and higher education very much dominate uh, R&D spend and activity in the UK, as it does in most other uh, countries. Uh, hence, that's been the main area of focus. Now, uh, Part one of the, the transformation of our research and development statistics was really to address the issue of underrepresentation or undercounting of small firms. Uh, we conducted joint work with HMRC to really bottom out which firms, which sectors that we were missing, um, uplifted and reweighted our estimates. And that was really a, a key driver in the, I think, around 17.1 billion uh, upward revision to our 2020 R&D figures for business. Then on higher education, um, using the track data, which some of you may be uh, familiar with, uh, cost accounting data from the Office for Students, we're really able to get a much better picture, particularly of 
R&D activity done within higher education, leading to, uh, I think, a revision of around 4.9 billion to our higher education R&D spend. We've also, of course, been looking at government uh, research and development, including uh, looking at microdata from uh, the government departments most heavily involved in this area. Uh, we published those results in April and alongside a methods note about what we're doing there. So really quite a lot of changes across the board. Uh, let's have a look and see what impact that's had on the numbers. My apologies, I'm going backwards. Um, here we go. So the dark navy line is our more recent uh, overall R&D uh, estimates. Uh, the dash line underneath it is our previous estimates for business. Uh, and then the grey line is a previous estimate for government R&D and the amber line at the top is government and higher education with that significant uplift to higher education expenditure that I mentioned previously. Um, so quite significant upward revisions. Uh, for those of you who uh, are aware of the government R&D target, 2.4% of R&D, we have been tracking somewhat below that level for some time. These revisions have lifted up above that. I think in 2021, we were just under 3% of R&D. Uh, and if you look at the next chart, you can see that we we kind of, uh, you could say middle of the pack, or you could say slightly better uh, than average uh, across the OECD. Uh, and you can see that figure, that's for 2021, just under 3%. Certainly uh, well below some countries, um, but uh, significantly better than that long tail on the right. Now, there is a very lively debate, which has been going on for some time, about what the appropriate level of R&D spend in the UK should be, and indeed what level of government support for research and development, which I'm sure that my colleagues on the panel will cover. Um, but I guess that what it does mean is that we're no longer really an outlier. Uh, so I think that inevitably begs other questions such as, uh, are we getting value for money out of that significant spend? Is it having the greatest impact? And are there areas that we might want to look at you know, further policy initiatives? Um, moving on to next steps. Uh, so phase one was basically getting the broad numbers right, with significant upward revisions. Phase two is a, a big increase in our business survey. We've increased the sample size by tenfold. That is currently out in the field and we should be publishing results from the new enhanced uh, business survey early in the new year. On government subnational, one of the key questions along, alongside the kind of government's levelling up agenda is where is that research and development spend occurring? Uh, again, we're developing more granular data sources to really, working with Go Science to really be able to answer that question. Um, and we're also engaging with international experts to really better understand uh, that we're we're in line with international best practice and we are measuring the right things. Um, now, obviously these will uh, f have fed through to our annual National Council Blue Book revisions uh, and the figures I mentioned, uh, the business R&D that will be coming out early next year will be feeding into next year's Blue Book revisions. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see kind of how, to what extent that changes the picture. My sense is the big changes uh, we've already seen. And I think I'll leave it there and uh, just want to make one other observation, which is uh, for those of you who've been following these debates, um, I think people started talking about R&D seriously about, Jonathan, correct me, about 30 years ago. And there is a large body of literature uh, on this, um, including on, on the impact of different policy interventions. Uh, but it's fair to say that I think a fairly consistent finding is that uh, there is a strong correlation between R&D spend and productivity, uh, obviously something of considerable interest in the UK at the moment, given our less than stellar productivity performance uh, of late, and also quite strong evidence. Indeed, there was an LSE paper published only last week looking at the, the knowledge spillovers, particularly of public sector or government research and development, which seem to be significantly higher uh, in terms of opening up new technological fields and particularly benefiting smaller firms than business R&D, uh, which I thought reinforcing some earlier research, but I thought quite, quite robust and really quite interesting new research. I'll hand over to my colleagues. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much indeed, Grant. And what you were just saying does very much tie into the agenda here at Resolution Foundation. We have been conducting a big economic inquiry over the past two years, and we're finally going to produce our report just in a couple of weeks now. And uh, indeed, for us, the interest is how you raise the growth performance of the British economy and to what extent R&D and innovation plays a role in that. And to some extent, your evidence that we are not an underspender on R&D compared with other advanced OECD countries, we're not, we're not in the lead, but we're in the, kind of in the middle of the pack, makes the puzzle of Britain's productivity performance even more challenging. Uh, one of the uh, obvious explanations has been cut away, so it means that we have to look elsewhere to spot why we are poorly performing. Uh, and we're going to hear more on that from our next two speakers. Before I introduce Jonathan, there is one practical point I should have mentioned, which is for our online participants, especially for people from Foundations in Science and Technology who are used to how we run FST events. For, for this, we're operating Q&A off Slido. If you go to the Resolution Foundation website and go to the events page, you'll be able to put your questions in on Slido so that we can have online participation as well when we get to the discussion. Uh, now we're going to hear from Professor Jonathan Haskell. Jonathan is an external member of the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England. He's also Professor of Economics at Imperial College. He has wit written widely on inten intangibles, really important books, uh, one with Stephen Westlake, bringing out the importance of intangibles to the British economy. But if I may give a plug to something else that he wrote, which I found particularly helpful, was an, uh, an, uh, a paper that, uh, by Jonathan Haskell and Gavin Wallace entitled Public Support for Innovation, Intangible Investment and Productivity Growth in the UK Market Sector. And this came out in February 2010. And I can still remember the rather fraught summer of 2010, negotiating with the Treasury on the science budget. And this was the main piece of evidence that um, I drew on and our team drew on. It and it shows, and Johnson may, he will speak uh, more widely, I'm sure, but um, it shows, and I quote, strong evidence of market sector spillovers from public R&D spend on research councils. In fact, you got a far better, more powerful spillover effect from public spending on research councils than from any other form of R&D spend. And I found that case, a recent fresh piece of economic analysis by a trusted economist, had a particular impact on the Treasury and really helped. Of course, Jonathan had very astutely got a co-author, Gavin Wallace, who also worked in the Treasury, and that was a bonus. <laughs> that was a very smart move, Jonathan. Anyway, over to you, Jonathan. Let's hear from you. Uh, thank you very much for those kind words, David, and thank you for inviting me. Is that your um, oh, yes, that's uh, yeah. iPad? Um, uh, look, it, it's lovely to be here, and especially um, uh, with, the, with the Foundation of Science and, and Technology. I'm mostly wearing my Imperial College hat on, as David has said. Um, I spend a lot of time looking at science and innovation. But could I put my Monetary Policy Committee hat on for a second? This is very dangerous because you know, the Monetary Policy Committee takes no view uh, on R&D. Um, but it, it, but it, it's to react to something that Grant just said, which is this. Often in the newspapers, when the ONS revise their data, there's some sort of apocalyptic headline saying, Monetary Policy Committee, you know, clash with ONS, revisions of data, and this, that, and the other. Can I just make it very clear that that is absolutely not the case? What you've heard from Grant is that the ONS have indeed revised the data, but they've revised the data because they've got better data. They've got more um, exchange of data from other institutions. They've processed it in a better way. There is nothing wrong with that whatsoever. So I just want to start the conversation, if I may, by putting that hat on, by putting all this, uh, by putting that, um, uh, that into, into context. OK, so let me go more then uh, onto the sort of intangible side. Um, how do these R&D revisions change UK performance? Um, I gave a talk last summer where I put up this diagram here. This is from the OECD website. 
this again is last summer, it shows the problem uh, which David in his introduction and Grant has just been talking about. The British R&D to GDP ratio is in red. The OECD average is in black. You can see that we're lagging behind. And so I thought um, I'd try to be a bit conscientious and update this slide uh, and see what the latest is. Um, and here it is. Um, you can see that the British R&D now looks rather better, but unfortunately it appears like the back series has not been uh, updated. So w w this is under the heading of here that there are many moving parts to this R&D story. So the first thing we need to understand is it might be that the level has changed, but we need to understand what the back data uh, is about there as well. So I don't know if you can see, sorry, for those of you maybe at home, on the right-hand side, the red line suddenly goes up right in 2014, which I think was Grant the first year of your slide, um, when the ONS revision has been. So we're going to have to be careful as a community when we start monitoring these things, especially making these international comparisons to get all this stuff um, right. So that's one moving part behind all of this. So one might ask the question, uh, if you did try to backcast this data, uh, what would it look like? Uh, the blue line is the business share of R&D. The red line is on the far right is Grant's figures, which you just saw a second ago. Um, and then I've sort of drawn a straight line, if you see what I mean, back to the blue line under the assumption that with the R&D tax credit, which started around the 2000s, um, maybe those two lines would intersect. So one might want to do that, for example, and then build up you know, a broader picture of what all these things are. But then, of course, the next bit of the moving part um, is to convert the nominal R&D spend, because this is a pound, shillings and pence number, into real spend. Um, and there we also get into another difficulty illustrated in this chart here. These are the R&D deflators across different countries. What do I mean by that? We have to divide this nominal by a deflator in order to get real euros, real pounds, real dollars, whatever it might be. And as you can see, there are a variety of R&D deflators which are used across different countries. So that grey is the swathe between all of the countries except Japan, who's at the very top, so those are the European countries. And you can see that some European countries think that the price of doing R&D has been, if I start at the very bottom left there, has been growing quite a lot. If you then divide an R&D number by that high growing number, you get a rather smaller number, if you see what I mean for, 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 uh, in real terms, than if you take one of those flatter numbers. So there's differences across different countries um, about how this uh, nominal spend converts into real volume. Uh, and what's the UK number? So the UK number uh, looks like this. It's this black line here, which is um, rising sharply, it's right at the bottom of the sway there, and then rises particularly sharply after 2015, which means that essentially we're going to be dividing a UK trend of R&D by an aggressively, relatively aggressively rising number. That's going to give us less real R&D than in other countries. So apologies if that's all a bit of a tangled explanation about how you get all this stuff. But it's another part of these moving parts. And so I think we also need to understand as a community not only how it is that we get these nominal R&D figures, but the real R&D, um, which is underneath, un underneath all of that. And again, making these international comparisons um, extremely difficult. So um, that, that, that's another issue I wanted to sort of put on the table. Um, now, how does this fit in more generally? Um, David, if you'll forgive me, give me a little bit of latitude to sort of talk more broadly about all of this. Um, so this is investment as a whole. The blue line is the volume of investment since 1997. And the red line carries on the trend if the pre-Brexit um, trend in investment had carried on. And you can see that the red line is above the blue line. So this updates a little bit of work that I did um, last year, which suggests that unfortunately, when we voted for Brexit, I shouldn't say unfortunately, that's what people voted for. And as again, my Bank of England had on, I put to have no view on that. But just what are the economic consequences of all of that? The economic consequences, unfortunately, is that investment, that blue line was much flatter relative to the previous trend. So I think that's part of the picture um, that we're labouring underneath. Now, as it turns out, if you do R&D and you do the same exercise, these are intellectual um, property estimates. This is R&D and software and artistic originals. It turns out that actually those numbers look rather the same. There hasn't been much um, change in the trend. 
um, which suggests that maybe Brexit wasn't too bad on the R&D side. But then that gets us back to how it is we're measuring all of this stuff and whether we're doing it um, in a consistent kind of way. So I think there's some puzzles um, around all of that um, as well. A couple more slides and then I'll, I'll stop. Um, if we broaden out the discussion, um, David very kindly mentioned my work that I've been doing with Stephen Westlake. Uh, what we stress is that the modern economy is indeed a knowledge economy, and R&D is an important part of that knowledge, but it's just one of a whole group of intangible investment. Uh, and I just wanted to put some of them on the page there for you. Software databases, R&D, uh, we've mentioned artistic originals, I mentioned that before. All of those are included in the GDP numbers, but other types of knowledge investment, design, training, branding, um, the kind of b uh, business process re-engineering uh, under the name of organisational capital, they're not included. So again, I think it's all part of a broader picture of understanding the kind of knowledge economy that, that we're moving into. Um, and where that takes you um, is this, again, apologies for this rather busy diagram. Um, this shows where the intangible investment is in the economy. And broadly speaking, the left-hand industries are the manufacturing industries, the right-hand industries are the services industries. That just happens to be how they're numbered. If one does this for R&D, lots of R&D is carried out in manufacturing, in aerospace, uh, in chemicals and all of that. But what you can see if one looks at this broader set of um, uh, measures is that lots of intangible investment is carried out everywhere, in particular in the service sector as well. That suggests if one wants to understand productivity in the service sector, um, it's not only R&D, but it's this broader range of investment uh, um, as well. Um, my final slide is entitled R&D and Beyond, and here's, here's, here's a couple of kind of um, talking points that maybe we could take up. Um, I, I think the evidence um, still carries on suggesting that public sector R&D uh, is complementary to private sector R&D and that public sector R&D has a spillover up to private sector R&D as well. Uh, David kindly mentioned our work and that's been updated as well and I think similar findings are forthcoming uh, on that. Second issue uh, around stability and certainty. If there's one thing that investment needs um, I think it's stability and uncertainty and the instability that unfortunately um, that, uh, uh, that has been around in the economy for um, reasons outside of our control, for reasons in our control, um, has hurt investment. I've got AI there, artificial intelligence. Um, so how does artificial intelligence fit into all of this? Um, some of it, of course, is embodied in software. Some of it is, of course, embodied in databases. Those are, an, uh, are reasonably well and perhaps not quite so well uh, measured in the data as well, so that's yet another challenge. But the broader issue with AI, it seems to me, um, is whether AI is in itself an innovation in doing innovation. Right? Maybe it's going to help the scientific community, uh, which Otto is supporting um, so strongly. Maybe it might help the scientific community do innovations more, more quickly and more readily as well. So that would be a very optimistic uh, uh, um, uh, source of uh, future productivity. One last slide, if I may, is the wider reach of R&D and intangibles. Um, again, if, if we think about these intangibles more broadly than R&D and think of them being outside the manufacturing sector, that raises the intriguing issue about getting productivity gains in what have hitherto been rather hard to improve sectors such as health uh, and so on. So let me leave it there. Thanks very much. Thank you uh, very much indeed, Jonathan. Uh, now we will hear from Professor Dame Otlin Lizer, who is the Regius Professor of Botany at Cambridge, but also, of course, is Chief Executive of UKRI. Uh, and I've had the privilege of serving on the board of UKRI for, for six years from its creation and, and finally stood down from the board uh, last week. And so now is the moment to say what a pleasure and a privilege it's been for me to be serving on that board and see at close hand what Ottolin does for the research community, both a commitment, of course, to uh, the highest standards of research integrity, a real interest in interdisciplinary research and a capacity to be open and communicative with the sector so that uh, scientists and researchers around the country understand what we at UKRI are trying to do. It's very good of Otlin to come along to be with us this evening. Over to you, Otlin. Thank you very much. Here. Thank you. So I, I did not bring slides, but I hope I will be able to um, set out some thoughts 
on this topic. Uh, I think David um, summarized it very well. In, in the context of all of this discussion, shall we say, about exactly how much we are investing in R&D compared to our um, international partners and neighbors, and um, whether those numbers reflect accurately the different kinds of investment, whether even the categories that we count are the right categories. All, I, this is all very important and useful, particularly in the context of these international comparisons, because when you do the international comparisons for productivity, um, we, we are flatlining in, in productivity as an economy. And for me, that's, that's a real challenge. And I, I agree that one of the main issues with the revisions in the figures is, whilst previously there was an argument that low public sector investment was the cause of our flatline productivity, that is not a very convincing argument anymore. And so we have to think instead, what is the cause of our flatline productivity? And um, the work that I particularly admire in that area on thinking about this in government was driven um, from Go Science by Patrick Valance and resulted in the production of the science and technology framework, which has become the, effectively the manifesto for the new Department for Science, Innovation and Technology. And that framework sets out 10 things at one point in its development. They were called the 10 big things. Um, at, uh, and then the 10 systems interventions that you need to think about in order to deliver the kind of high productivity, high growth economy that we are looking for. And um, those 10 things I can list, but I actually will do it in the context of a, a, what I now think of as a kind of visual uh, representation that captures not only the things, but really, really importantly, the, the integration and the articulation between them, because this is not a list of 10 things. This is a, a description of 10 interventions into the research and innovation system that you need to align in order to deliver the kind of high growth economy that we need. So I, I like to think about this as a triangle with, and the three um, vertices of the triangle are high productivity, innovative, high growth businesses with high quality jobs, high quality, high productivity, innovative and therefore affordable public services. Um, including you know, things like the National Health Service, but also critically national security and so on. And then the third um, uh, point of the triangle is highly skilled, healthy, prospering people. And those three things you in, uh, just instinctively, intuitively and obviously deeply interconnected. You need the highly skilled, healthy, prospering people to do the jobs in the businesses and the public services, but also by working in those uh, high quality jobs, for the innovative businesses that supports the well-being of the people and obviously the public services support their health and education and skills. What we need to do as an economy is connect up those three corners properly so that um, we drive up uh, our, our productivity and our, our growth in a way that those three corners mutually support one another. And um, the way that we quite often currently think about that is, is in a way that, that, that doesn't think about how one invests the public money, like, um, well, the, the tax money, in the most effective way, I think, to do that. So if you think about um, tax, it comes from the high positivity, innovative businesses and the jobs, and it's used to support the public services. And if one takes too much money out of the businesses to support the public services, you are then in danger of, a, of a getting trapped in a, in a debt spiral, which, um, results in insufficient investment in either of those things and that I think is the the, uh, uh, the possibility that we currently face. So we need to think much more imaginatively according to the 10 things of the science and technology framework about how we invest those tax dollars, um, pounds. So for example, and perhaps most obviously, if we think about um, using public procurement really wisely, you, you uh, invest in the procurement of things for your public services in a way that actually supports your high productivity, um, innovative businesses through procuring um, products and services from them for public services, then that spend of tax 
through public procurement supports businesses and public services rather than takes from businesses to give to public services. And I would argue very strongly that public investment in research and innovation is another critical way in which you can invest tax spend much more wisely to drive the three corners up rather than um, that suck things down. Um, because that R&D investment supports so many different elements of the science and technology framework, it supports skills. If I invest in research projects in universities or public sector research establishments, wherever they are, there are skilled people learning through the research and innovation that they conduct. Those people, if they move freely and more widely through the economy, through the businesses in the public sector, then uh, we can drive those skills, drive adoption and diffusion of new technologies, for example, across the system. And so what that tells you is you need the investment, for example, in skills, but you then need aligned incentives that go with that investment that carry the people um, across the system rather than lock them, for example, in their places. And that um, is where UKRI comes into the picture. We are half of public sector spend on research and innovation, a, a little bit less than that now, um, because other government departments have had their R&D budgets increased, which is fantastic. Um, and our opportunity, though, because we span all disciplines and all sectors, is to build a really aligned portfolio of investment across the multiple things that you need in the science and technology framework, skills, infrastructure, um, those brilliant discoveries and new ideas, innovation, um, and targeting particular priorities where we have a comparative advantage, particular technologies like AI that's been mentioned. So our portfolio of investments can drive forward those things in a balanced way, but aligned with incentives that connects up the three corners of the triangle in a way that drives the, the kinds of shifts we want to see. So th that's where I see we need to go with this. And through that, we build exactly the confidence and the stability into the system that really leverages the private sector investment, which is actually um, where all the action is. That, as we heard, that has got to be the vast majority of the investment. And absolutely, the 10 things of the science and technology framework are critically necessary to build that stable platform with infrastructure, with regulations and standards, with clear long-term signaling about what we're doing, with tech prioritization, deep international engagement, and uh, the skills and uh, services that we need. Linking all of those things together will build a foundation on which private sector investment can be crowded in with confidence. And, and that's the goal. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Othlin. Um, I'm going to take you a couple of online questions and then come to the audience here. But um, one issue, and I'm going to start with Grant on this, is that although your figures show that um, we are in general now, Britain is a kind of middle of the pack for OECD, the distribution of that support between public expenditure and tax credits is unusual. Um, now, one question we've had from Emma that should come up on the screen now. She says R&D tax credits are essential to catalyse that R&D output and impact. So, and of course, the government, the Treasury, is looking at ways in which, in her words, you could slash the support. Is that counterproductive? Um, on the other hand, you could argue that the Treasury have got an exaggerated preference for tax relief because it doesn't count as public spending. And if we're, again, trying to find the puzzle of why we've got this now respectable levels of R&D spend and wider econ a poorer economic performance more generally, perhaps we're spending the money too much through R&D tax credits. But um, Grant, do you want to start on that and just where we are factually for our spend? Uh, I can, but uh, Treasury have not shared their thinking on um, the relative merits of different ways of um, boosting R&D spend. So certainly on the, on the policy dimensions of that, I'm sure other members of the panel have views, but uh, I don't. Um, in terms of the, you're talking about the distribution between tax credits and other elements. I unfortunately don't have those numbers. Isn't it the case that, our ta that the tax relief is a higher part of the overall R&D effort, 2.4%, 3%, whatever it is, and the public expenditure a lower part? And 
you do see those graphs. Isn't the distribution a bit different? With other comparable countries, yes. Yeah. Um, and the revision that you've done, the upward revision to three, uh, the 3%, has that changed the composition? I, sorry, I don't have the numbers in front of me. Right. Okay. But I, I will look into it. Yeah. Jonathan, your observations. Yeah, I think one of the issues, David, with the R&D tax credits, I mean, this has been a long argument, I think mm. your time in government um, as well, um, is that they seem to work pretty well for small firms, but we're not quite so sure for big firms. And the part of the difficulty, of course, is that many big firms are doing R&D anyway. So we're into this dreadful business that economists don't give this a very nice name, sort of dead weight, which is essentially subsidising an activity which would have been undertaken in any case. Um, and I, I think that jury's still a little bit out um, on that to be the case. Um, I think certainly uh, as far as uh, R&D tax credits, as far as the patent box is concerned, many economists are extremely dubious about the patent box and feel that that um, has got massive dead weight loss um, to it as well. So I think that's a sort of slight difficulty with R&D tax credits is seeing our way through all of that. Yeah. Otlin, your observations on this? Um, so I... I uh, agree this is an area where one really needs the evidence and the evidence as usual is quite complex. Uh, the data I've seen certainly show that one of the things that's unusual about the UK is the amount of tax credits for R&D that we offer. Um, as someone who is trying extremely hard to make the best use of direct investment in that coordinated portfolio way uh, and knowing the evidence that um, our investments uh, are definitely leverage a, a lot of benefit, uh, both direct and then indirect, and also crowd in private sector uh, investment. Doing those comparisons would be um, would be interesting, and certainly from the point of view of uh, direct public in se se sector investment, you have much more control. So if you think there are five priority technologies for the UK, for example, and you want to support those five technologies disproportionately, doing it through direct investment is clearly uh, uh, easier than, than through tax credits. Yeah, absolutely. And the, ta the tax credit logic is partly the pure kind of neoliberal who we'd have a view on anything. Let's just support R&D, which is, a, is a high, an understandable principle. Um, and in my experience with ministers, it lasts about three months, after which you find you've got a priority or there's something that needs to be done or you think, why well, we need to promote more R&D and some other, and you then look around for the levers and the lever, the public expenditure lever is relatively small relative to the general tax credit lever in the UK. Um, I'm going to move to one other online question and then turn to our audience here. But this comes from... Um, David Connolly, I'm going to start by putting it to Otlin, because uh, again, it's a kind of trying to, and there are lots of, and I hope we'll hear from the audience here as well, speculative explanations to this puzzle that we're wearing. He's saying, but what we do with these uh, successful university research spin-outs uh, is they'll, they're sold to a foreign corporation. Um, and I remember one American investor saying to me, the great thing about the British R&D system is you create the world's best corporate veal. You create the, and we're the beef in America, you're the veal. And we, the, we create endlessly, we create this stuff. But um, in the words of David Connell's question, is further UK growth truncated because it doesn't necessarily generate long-term growth in the UK? Is this an issue often? Do you want to comment on that? Yes, I think it's a huge issue, um, and it is the the one of the key points in our system that is currently not functioning as well as it could for the UK economy. Um, it's not spin outs. We do very well at spin outs. It's scale up, it, and there are. Uh, I was. I would add to scale up actually um, not only. Uh, uh, companies being sold to overseas companies, but also companies. Um, having to base their or deciding to base their manufacture overseas. So quite often lots of wonderful R&D in the UK but manufacture overseas where most of the value capture is actually in, in the manufacture. And um, whilst I uh, agree that um, the service sector in the UK is extremely important, there is real value for the economy in high value add manufacture. I don't think we're going to be um, straightforwardly a, a low 
I mean, a high volume, low value manufacturing nation, but high value add, we can really make quite a big difference, I think. So those two elements, I think, are, are, are key in this issue. Lots and lots of work done trying to understand why that is. And there are, as usual, I would say multiple different um, convincing reasons. Um, indeed, from a university spin-out point of view, um, uh, we're expecting imminently the publication of a, a Treasury and DSET um, review of university spin-outs that um, partly looks about how you can create scale-up ready spin-outs. Uh, there are a, a few um, different issues, one being perhaps our companies spin out too early, so they're not really um, in a position to attract the, the private capital that they need to to get them over the famous valley of death. So that's uh, one issue. Do we need more um, kind of uh, follow-on funding for new ideas before they spin out? There's a cultural issue that people quite often raise. Um, you know, people in the UK are very happy to sell out for a, a few million rather than wanting to scale up. Uh, that's, that's, I hear that one often. I don't have any direct evidence for it, but uh, it's an interesting one. Um, the one I'm much more interested in is uh, anxiety about the UK investor community and their willingness to invest in, in um, innovative startups. And some of that is regulatory, and that is um, being shifted as fast as we can for the big um, asset uh, uh, managers. But some of it, again, I think comes down to the fact, and I emphasise this point when I was speaking before, the main weakness, in my view, in our r &I system is it is balkanised. People go to university and never leave. Um, if they do leave, they go to a business and stay in business. Um, we need much more movement of people between the academic, business, policy, investor um, um, sectors. If we had proper churn of people, the whole thing would be way better connected. Everybody would feel more confident and know people. It's all people. They would know people to pick up the phone and say, you know, what do you think about this? And that, I think, is a key opportunity for the UK. We're relatively small. It should be completely doable. We need to shift the incentives to make that happen. That's a very, that's a very powerful point. And I must say, the, uh, the flow of people linking university research, the city, the finance, is so important. And of course, our education system and early specialisation makes this harder. There are a lot of people sitting in the city managing very large amounts of money who think this is all just very scary stuff. One tech um, entrepreneur put it to me very well. He said, the rule is, if you're raising money in the UK, take your CFO. If you're raising money in the US, take your CTO. In America, they're interested in the, in the technology. They get it. In Britain, they want to go through the figures of these speculative cash forecasts three years out. And it's a different, it's a different conversation. Um, Jonathan, do you, want to, do you want to comment on this? I, I, I'm, I'm going to sound a little bit of a contrary note, if I may. I, I guess I'm too much of an economist. Um, it seems to me that if foreign corporations have got a comparative advantage uh, and can bring together synergies, which will make a British-initiated uh, R&D project better, um, they should be able to go ahead and do it, and we will all benefit from it. Now, I absolutely accept that there might be security issues, uh, you know, and, 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 and those types of things where we, where we wouldn't want foreign corporations for that to be the case, and that's a political come security issue, uh, and I bow to others with much more expertise um, than me. But uh, fundamentally, I, I think if we have some open trade, that is a good thing, actually. Um, so maybe I'm a bit more relaxed about this. The, the other issue, of course, um, is that if we don't have a financial ba and banking system which is going to um, adequately support these, um, uh, you, you know, R&D intangible uh, investing firms, then they're going to rely upon being bought out further down the train in order to start in the first place. Um, so we, um, if we're going to intervene on that side, we've got to be very careful, therefore, that we don't displace uh, what might actually be, uh, uh, um, you, you know, the, the, uh, the incentive to start up. Um, in the very beginning. Uh, and that takes one, of course, I think, to try to fix our financial system a little bit uh, mm -hmm. um, as well as, part, as mm. part of this discussion, I think. Yeah, and scaling up his experience. I remember a conversation with Demis Asalvis asking him about selling DeepMind to Google and whether there was an option for DeepMind to carry on as a, as a, as a UK enterprise. And, uh, uh, and one, he said, look, the, 
the, the cost of the compute power that we use to do our work at DeepMind is approaching a billion dollars a year. Mm. There was no way we were going to get a billion dollars a year of access to compute capacity without joining something like Google. If you said, if UK, does UK or I have a billion dollars a year compute capacity to give to us? Sadly not. So no, then, I'm, I'm, I'm very struck, I must yeah. say, David, when you go to Google, I always thought computer hardware is computer hardware. Everybody's got fast yeah. computer hardware. When you go to Google, they've really got fast <laughs> computer hardware. So I think that is yeah. a very salient issue, yeah. actually. Yeah. Um, and uh, Grant, any observations on this yourself? Um, well, I think, I mean, I'm, I, I tend to agree somewhat with, with Jonathan's observations that um, you get lots of, you get lots, I, I think this whole area, the broader issue, not just far and deep, but of investment, you do get lots of fads that come and go. Mm. Um, and you get lots of ideas which sound highly plausible, but aren't necessarily strongly based on the evidence. So, um, and you get some of the more speculative uh, observations that Otterlin mentioned. Uh, I, I think, you know, if, if I were in Treasury, I'd be um, doing my due diligence and seeing where the evidence takes me rather than just jumping on whatever the latest anecdotal observations are that you, you hear in this sector. Um, but having said that, you know, we're clearly at a time when public sector finances are quite challenging. Uh, and if you can get more bang for the buck out of what we're currently spending mm. on government and higher education R&D, then absolutely we should mm. be doing that. And actually, and look, the university spin out a program that Otlin was referring to is reporting next week as part of the autumn statement. I've been on the group doing it and obviously there's a lot of meat to come next week, but I think one crucial treasury point is the value from these, um, this, you know, this research culture is captured more widely across the economy. It doesn't all need to be captured by university owning shares. That's not the mechanism whereby economic value from these activities is to be captured. They are keen to promote the idea that you're looking at a, at a wider innovation ecosystem, which often is always reminding us of. Now, let's turn to people physically here. We've got a roving mic. If you could give your name and organisation, that'd be fantastic. We'll start there. Yes, and I may, as I see several questions, I'm actually going to, let's collect two or three. Yeah. Um, my name is Geoffrey Owen, Foreign Exchange. Um, I think I might in saying that Boris Johnson is your, is your microphone close to your mouth? I'm just thinking of our online participants. Just check it's working, because otherwise the online people won't be able to hear. Um, I think I'm right in saying it's <laughs> not on. any change. Oh. Uh, that, anyway, maybe people can hear it. But Boris Johnson, not long after he became Prime Minister, announced a very, very big increase in government spending on R&D. And it was presented very much as a kind of step change biggest such increase that had ever happened and so on. I, my question, one, two questions. Is that the case? Has there been a step change? Is, is more money now being made available, for example, to UKRI? And within, if, if there is more money, is, the, is it being allocated in a different way, or is it more or less the same as it has been right. before? For example, is yep. there any change right. in the Right. I understand. We're going to, I'm going to pause there because I think I'm just going to repeat that first of all because I'm not sure people online will have heard it. This is about what has happened to the increase in spend that was announced by Boris Johnson, how much has gone to UK Ryan, if so, there's been a change in spend. And let's now uh, move on to a couple of other questions. Let's hope with the new microphone those are being picked up. So let's, the gentleman here, yeah. So I'm, I'm David Conn. I'm here in, in the flesh. Oh. So, uh, I, I'd like to make... Uh, <laughs> two for that price of one. <laughs> I, I, I'd like to, to add a sort of rider to the question and also maybe connect up what Otterlin was saying with the, the earlier comments on Andy tax credits, of which I've, I've been a, a critic. Hold the mic very close into your mouth. Yeah. I've been, been a, 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 a strong critic of Andy tax credits. Um, the, the extra point in my question was particularly its um, VC-backed university spin-outs in particular, right. uh, which, if they're promising, tends to be sold to large corporations, 
quite often US the growth then truncated. Now, now the rider to that is of course not all university synouts are VC backed. Most are. Uh, and it's increasingly easier to do that. But you look at ABCAM, ACORN, uh, uh, ARM wasn't really a university spin out, no venture capital. Dyson, not a university right. spin out, never raised venture capital. Oxford Instruments, never raised venture capital. Um, CAT was unable to raise venture capital. Uh, and the point is, I think, that um, if you raise venture capital in today's world, and I was a VC, so I know, if you're successful, you will be sold. As a VC, right. you have to make money by selling your businesses generally to an American right. corporation. Right. But the, uh, the, the difference is this other group who pursued a different strategy would never have been able to raise venture capital to, to, to benefit significantly from R&D tax credits because they were spending sweat equity, basically, or earning revenues for R&D from customers. So we're putting all our money into right. supporting kind of companies that are going to be being right. sold that is very a, little into those. So your argument is the R&D tax credits are particularly effective if, if it's VC funding. And that the uh, VC RBC funding in terms... are great for VCs, yeah. super, right. but not yeah. very good I understand. for the arms, the Dysons, the... Advent I understand your future. point. Right, now I'm going to look at... We're going to take... Now there's a, there's a gentleman towards the back there on that side. We're going to take that intervention and then we will pause and go to our panel. Yes. Hello, I'm Ross Rigolo of the Nafield Foundation. I just have a question. We, we spent pretty much all the time talking about the R&D funding, but I think there's also a question about our, uh, research productivity and the common right. idea that ideas are hard, getting harder to find. Yes. And so my question is twofold. One, to which degree panelists think that research productivity is declining and ideas are harder to find? And two, what does that imply for R&D spending and how we approach right. it? Right, that's very good. And I think, Oslin, let's start with you, because I think especially the first and the third questions are very UKRI oriented. Yeah. First question, I I'm afraid I didn't hear that question very well. Oh, this, was, this is the sort of argument about the decline in the performance of R&D, you know, to get, even though you've got Moore's Law, the amount of uh, R&D spend you need to get each successive iteration of Moore's Law has gone up mu massively. So you have to spend more and more money to get a given innovation. I think that was the question, and there is an, indeed a yeah. lively debate about it. And then the first question was about um, what happened to the money that Boris Johnson sent a cheque to you for. Yes, um, <laughs> I can, I can uh, certainly answer both those questions. So, yes, there was a significant increase across the last spending review in total government R&D spend from about $14 billion to $20 billion across that period of time. Um, that increase, as I mentioned earlier, um, was partly used to um, refill the R&D budgets across government, which had been gradually eroded. That's extre extremely important because every department needs to um, innovate and every department therefore needs to have skin in the game in the investment in their own R&D needs. Our budget uh, um, has increased over that time, but rather than by that kind of 25% number, more by 15% because... Uh, as I say, it went disproportionately across government, which I think is a fantastic idea. Um, our budget was, and, and again, our investment, the, the budget that came in was uh, weighted towards Innovate UK. Um, so their budget went up um, uh, almost doubled, actually, across that period of time. But the budgets of the other councils, so the seven disciplinary councils and Research England that funds the block grants into universities also saw a, you know, a, a significant rise. I should say though that the way our budgets now work, because we are UKRI, we are one organisation and we are absolutely committed to um, interdisciplinarity in its many forms, about a third of our budget is in those seven disciplinary research councils. About a third in combination is in Research England and Innovate UK. But a third of our budget is collectively managed across the whole of UKRI. So to answer your question, are we doing different things with it than what we did? The answer is definitely yes, because through our ability to coordinate our budgets across the whole of UKRI, we can invest in ways that we, we simply couldn't before. Um, for example, we're running a pan-UKRI interdisciplinary response mode call um, so that you don't have to pick where to send your um, new um, research idea. You can send it to a committee that can 
assess anything at all as long as it um, has that interdisciplinary twist. And do you want to comment on the sort of yes, productivity? Yes, absolutely. Of so I, I, uh, this is, you know, I read the, I read the paper. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I'm very unconvinced by the analysis. And I suppose one can um, think about that in a variety of ways. And, and I, would, I would think about it in a kind of Kuhnian way. I think all um, areas of investigation start with some new way of thinking about something and then they will drive things up incrementally for a while and then they will plateau. And so um, we were talking earlier, AI is going to have a dramatic impact on the way that we are able to do science, the amount of money it will cost and those technological advances which you know very much are um, one of uh, the fantastic things that, that David has championed, the, in all the disciplines I know, particularly you know in, in biology where I work, I, I you know my claim to fame as a, as a scientist almost is doing a thing which took multiple ones of us multiple years that you could now do in a week, and so I, I just don't buy the idea that that our productivity is somehow going down scientifically, and I also don't buy the idea that looking at it in, an, in particular disciplines or you know, in particular areas is, is the right way to do it because the huge breakthrough in whatever it was you're looking at isn't going to come through that. It's going to come from left of field from somewhere you never even noticed. Right. Thank you very much. Jonathan, do you want to pick up, particularly in this exchange with David, whether we've got a kind of financing model that means we are there's a great big for sale sign over UK innovation that is more prominent and more seductive than in other countries. Well, I, I, I think I'd like to see a bit of evidence on that, actually. I'm always struck you go to other countries and they say, oh, well, the trouble is with Germany or the trouble you, it, when you go to Germany or the trouble in Japan if you go to Japan is we do, you know, basic R&D and then foreigners buy it and we can't translate it and all that kind of thing. So... It, it seems to be a sort of dictum here across a lot of countries, uh, and I'm just not sure, actually. Could I say one thing mm. on the R&D oh, yeah. productivity yeah, thing? I support, um, obviously, what you said very strongly. It seems to be the leading examples of the R&D getting harder around pharma and drugs and all that kind of thing, which is, um, there's, you know, that, that's a very important area of um, endeavour, but it's something one can identify. But, but I must say... If I hang around with my imperial colleagues, I've heard many stories, Ocelin, of the, uh, of the, way, that you, the way that you discuss it. So, so Steve Bloom, for example, um, who works on, uh, uh, on um, these kind of issues, you know, diagnosing diabetes and all that kind of thing, has talked about how computers can look much more clearly at these things. But then other cancer specialists will tell you computers actually aren't very good at all of this. So I think it's quite variegated. Um, uh, and two more things, if I may, mm. is, um, again, going back to what I was saying, if you'll forgive me, um, it's not just R&D, which is about innovation, right? Uh, so software, it would seem to me, the idea that, uh, that writing software is getting more complicated, surely it's exactly the other way around, and AI is going to be very helpful with, with all of that. And I want to put in just a bit of a plea for music. Is music getting, is it getting harder to write new music? I don't know. I suppose some people would say since the Beatles, nothing has happened. But, you know, <laughs> unless, unless one takes that view, um, I'm not sure whether it's getting harder to write new music. Um, so I, I would like to see some of these other types of examples as well. Right. Very interesting. Anything you want to comment on that? Well, it's going to make a similar point, Adeline, about research productivity. But I think wh where this comes from is there's been a faster increase among most metrics in the number of scientists in the world in the last 20 or 30 years than it has in innovation measured by patents or, or some other kind of metric. So if you divide number of patents, say, by number of scientists, you get what looks like a slowdown in productivity. But I absolutely agree that that's, if you're looking at those incremental areas of innovation, you are looking at a classic S-curve where you get the big transformational change and then more gradual improvements until you plateau. But that ignores the fact that new discoveries AI being a very obvious example are emerging, which particularly have revolutionary impacts and create whole new fields. And a lot of the existing metrics that you would use for the research productivity argument are not, really are not able to capture that because they're too, they're too new. Um, but it would be worth revisiting this in 10 years to see if we're right. Yep, indeed, we'll keep it a lot under review. Right, we're going to collect another range of questions. Let's start 
with the gentleman there in the front row, and then there's some more. We'll try to get those for you. Yeah. Right. Hi, I'm Ben. I'm the Director of Innovation and Technology at the CBI. Um, we still represent nearly all of the largest investors, private investors uh, in, uh, in R&D. And I think as we become a more in R&D intensive economy, the business is very comfortable and expects that business would be a larger percentage of the overall spending. But there's also, I think, David, you mentioned it at the top, there's the, the rather viral uh, piece of research from LSE uh, that suggests that the decline in public R&D in the US can explain around a third of the decline in productivity growth in the US from 1950 to 2018. And I wonder if we actually need to re revisit the role of public investment rather than an automatic assumption that private investment takes more of the strain as we become more more R&D intensive. Yeah. Very interesting. That ties in very much with Jonathan's earlier research. And then, yes, behind you. Yes, immediately behind you, yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Alex Hampshire. I work at the Treasury. Um, a recent report from the FSB suggested that the government should be ring-fencing 10% of the R&D budget specifically for diffusion and adoption of new technologies. I was wondering if you could provide a, a commentary on that, what the government's doing, whether we should be doing more. Right, yep. And I'm going to count, as we've got so many questions, we're just going to keep on going so everybody has their voice. But yes, and if you pass that along sideways, that's it. Yep. Thank yep. you, David. Uh, David Robinson, Market News. Just to clarify, are you saying that the fiscal multipliers on tax credits will be lower than on direct investment and R&D? And in the accounting sense, and I guess this is for Grant, do tax credits actually count under R&D? Because they seem to be revenue foregone rather than public spending. Right. That is a specific way. Then I think, uh, this, yes, pass along there, and then we'll come to the front. Right. This is a bit of a left-field one. Uh, I, one of the elephants in the room is the uh, capability of uh, R&D to recruit enough uh, young people and competent people who can deliver innovation. I've spoken to Ottoline about this before. We, ha we are still failing in promoting STEM, science, technology, and maths to young people. And unless we can actually crack that one, we've been at it for goodness knows how long, I'd like the view of the panel whether R&D actually has a risk that we haven't got enough human resources and what to do about it. Right, okay. And then at the front here, we're keeping on going. Yep. Thanks. Greg, Greg Watson. Um, picking up on the point about ARM, um, this was an example of a company that was founded, funded, um, in collaboration with some existing industry players. It's gone on to be hugely successful. All the experience in deep tech innovation shows that in nearly every case, collaboration with major companies is the critical factor that determines success. How much attention is being given to that on a fact-based um, approach within the economics community and innovation community? Um, and how much planning is being done to accelerate this collaboration? Right, that's another very good question. Now I'm going to move across to this side. Because uh, there's so many people who want to intervene. Yes, I think lady towards the back there. Yep, yep. Hi, thank you. Really interesting presentations there. It's Hilary Leeshing from AstraZeneca, Director of Science and Innovation Policy. Uh, my question is really simple. It's um, similar to Ben's from CBI. It's just about um, incentivizing businesses to invest and what the panel's views are on that. Right. And I think, uh, yeah. We, I think I'm just going to keep on going because we, I want to have everybody to have a voice <coughs> and then we'll turn to the panellists for their final observations. But there's a lot of intervention. I want to hear them all. Yep. Thank you. I'm Tony McBride from the Institute of Physics. I'm going to answer a question. Ah, there was a, a question good. asked just a few minutes ago about skills, the impact of skills shortages on R&D. The IAP has done some research of our own with the CBI. And we found from interviewing 300 R&D intensive physics-based businesses that two-thirds of them said they would increase their R&D investment in the next five years compared to the last five years. That's really significant because about a third of all bird business R&D in the UK comes from physics-based businesses. However, the, that, that's a really big opportunity. However, uh, two-thirds also said they had 
slowed or stopped R&D in the last five years because they couldn't access the skills needed to undertake R&D. So that's a big missed opportunity. And what that tells us is that skill shortages are already pacing a break on R&D and innovation in the UK. Right. Thank you. I think were there some, yeah, two more interventions. Yes, the gentleman in the corner there, yeah. Hi, uh, Francis Glossbill. I'm currently DEFRA, but a few years ago I helped set up the um, Advanced Research and Innovate Invention Agency on Earth Treasury. And I guess my, my question is about, a lot of the discussion here is about um, spend, but I wonder what is the what does the panel view on the role of regulation in promoting competition, particularly noting that an increasing amount of R&D spend is concentrated in fewer and fewer larger and larger firms? Uh, competition... Bit, when you say Promoting funds, you mean comp you mean divergent? Are you talking about funders or doers? Uh, either. Right, right. Uh, and yes, let's pass the microphone forward. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, my name's Jim Hall from the University of Oxford. I've got a, a, a statistical question and a substantive question. Um, I mean, the data question is that um, we've identified that the, the readjustment of the R&D expenditure underlines the question of, well, why has productivity not gone up? And um, I mean, Mark Carney has posited that part of this is because that the productivity before the crash was actually inflated. Um, and I'm wondering whether, in particular, Grant and Jonathan, w what they make of that. And actually, since 2008, um, productivity actually may have been higher than was, was estimated. Um, and then the substantive question is, um, well, um, if R&D has not been feeding through into productivity, what have we not been doing enough of? And I mean, the implication of, of Otterline's yep. talk is we haven't been doing enough of the 10 big things, and I kind of am inclined to agree with that. But where would your emphasis lie in terms of the things which we have not been doing enough of in order to create that productivity growth? Right, yep. Intervention at the front here. Hello, um, my name is William Cullenband and I've founded a publication called Research Fortnight a long time ago um, and wrote editorials arguing for R&D <laughs> tax credits and lots of the things that you guys are now doing. Um, I'm just as a way of trying to answer your question you've got here about you know, what is the basic problem that we've got in the UK and how does R&D fit into it? And I'd be interested in your thoughts about that. I mean, you've said that we're getting these fantastic spillovers from what the research councils are doing. You're doing all of these kinds of, I would say, Othleen, when you're describing what you're doing at UKRI, quite kind of horizontal, generic type things, right, which don't involve... Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Well, maybe, you're, maybe you are doing other things, but that, that didn't come across in what you said. Um, and I remember from all of that time, from 1994 when we started, um, we lived rough, you know, all the policy across the different governments really fell under the shadow of Margaret Thatcher's injunction to not do near market research. And I don't know how much that has really changed, but isn't the obvious explanation for what our problem is that you know, we've had these twists and turns about industrial strategy, which comes and goes, right? Isn't the obvious explanation that we're just not doing that, putting that effort into the near market research? Uh, and there was a late intervention at the back. Uh, we're going to, sorry, I've got to go. And then I think, and we are, and again, it's an opportunity. I'm going to start with Grant because several of the questions have been about just interpreting the data. Um, I just wondered whether we um, need to define R&D a bit differently. Mm -hmm. um, tonight we've been talking about um, manufacturing and, and tech and so forth, but one thinks about the UK economy being very service-based and think about all the financial engineering and research and innovation, um, the cultural sector, huge amounts of innovation and research. And I just wonder whether um, we aren't being too narrow in our definition of R&D. But... Um, Right. That's, now we've got a lot, and I'm not expecting our panelists to answer every question. Maybe, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I wouldn't be able to assess whether they had or not. There were so many. But we just get, it's an opportunity really for, for final observations prompted by the really interesting range of questions being put. Interpreting the data, and I'm afraid I'm going to throw in an extra data question which has come in online, which is what do you know about the geographical distribution of R&D spend and activity? Okay, well, let, let, 
as, as well. I'm adding that to your list. Yeah. So the, the, have we, are we measuring productivity wrongly in the UK? Well, um, we do revise our GDP numbers annually. And when we introduce the Transform Labour Force Survey in March next year, we will revise the historical labour market series, which may have some impact on our labour productivity measures. But I don't think it's going to fundamentally change the picture. And I, I think if, we, we tend to always look for UK specific, often cultural explanations for this period since 2008, 2010 of low productivity. That would be more convincing if we hadn't seen very similar trends across most other OECD countries since then. So that does suggest that there are some global factors at work and it is not a uniquely UK problem and also that it's a multifactorial problem. Now, of course, the ESRC have commissioned some really interesting work at the Productivity Institute on this. Uh, we've been working with them in partnership on trying to unpack what those drivers are, but I think we would need a, another Resolution Foundation event to really dig into the details. Um, on the measurement issue about tax credits, we work closely with HMRC, um, but we use the, their tax credit data to validate, corroborate, and basically check uh, that we're capturing what's going on out there. And of course, that was a major factor in the uplifting and reweighting of uh, our existing data collections. And I think when we get the results from our much larger survey early next year, I think that will give us a better sense of uh, to what extent we have in the past been missing some of the picture, particularly with smaller firms. Um, I don't expect we'll necessarily fundamentally change the story, but then going to that third point, it will give us much more granular subnational data. And I think that will be really interesting to kind of see. We, we as another uh, person commented, you know, there tends to be a lot of R&D spend clustered in a handful of large companies. But I think the, the new data, survey data next year, will give us a better picture of what's happening at small and medium enterprises across the country and what kind of regional geographical pattern that has. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. Thank you. Um, Jonathan, your, your observations. Yeah, a couple of things. So thanks very much for some really good questions. On this issue, the very last question, on the wider spend, um, creativity and all that kind of thing, um, the way I interpret that is we shouldn't broaden our definition of R&D because um, we need to stick with international um, uh, definitions, but we can think more broadly about the kind of knowledge investments that the creative sector makes, which might be, as I say, in music or in software or in design um, or, or, or something like that. So that, that's the direction in which I would go. Um, there's a series of questions around kind of competition and relations yeah. with firms and all of that. So let me try, try and gather those together a little bit. I think one of the features of an R&D orientated economy, an intangible style economy, um, is that putting these intangibles together gets you tremendous synergies. Right, being able to, you know, an iPad is a is a collection of, you know, incredible software, amazing design, fantastic marketing, and all of those synergies together gather those things together. Now, what that means is probably those firms who are really good at that are just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And as they get bigger and bigger and bigger, they're going to exploit those synergies and do better, which is great for the consumer. But on the other hand, we then start to worry about market power and we start to worry about competition policy. Um, I, I can't remember who asked the question. I think it was from over there. But we start to argue about competition policy when we look at large firms. So where that takes one, I think, is a refocusing of competition policy to more rivalry amongst firms, not the, how big or small firms are, but more rivalry. And that, I think, would help us um, get more R&D uh, investment going with these larger firms and get those synergies to work to our advantage. Thank you very much. Otlin? Yes, a uh, uh, wonderful array of questions um, to which one cannot do justice in a short amount of time. Um, uh, big and small companies and so on, very interesting because it's incredibly sector specific. So um, we are uh, really uh, doing fantastically well on quantum technologies. That's an incredibly SME-driven sector. Similarly, I would say the creative industries, um, where uh, they do do a huge amount of very straightforwardly um, frascati type R and D because it's uh, it's actually a very high-tech sector now. Mm. So uh, both of those huge uh, contributions to the UK economy, uh, mostly through SME um, ecosystems, and we need to think about the. 10 things, for example, not only in the context of the really big players, but also in those disruptive sectors that are much more SME driven. And, and that, 
adds to the complexity of what we need to do. Um, and in, in the context of the, the sort of heavy lifting from private investment, that, I mean, that, Always, the, the private investment is, is a higher proportion than the public investment. But if we get that triangle going right, both go up. Um, it, it's not that, that you, 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 know, you wait, you, you sort of stick with your... The whole point is, if you increase productivity, you will have more, more um, uh, national wealth to invest. And, and that's the whole point of getting that connection um, going round. Um, in terms of uh, the... the spectrum of the type of investment we make. Um, it's it, a little, I guess there's an extent to which I highlighted already that there is some evidence that we need some investment um, before companies spin out, for example, that, that um, because they're spinning out a bit too early, that speaks a little bit to your point. But actually, I would argue that um, more interestingly uh, is the work that um, UK and all other funders around the world have done on, on challenge-led funding where um, we see incredibly good leverage of private sector investment and indeed um, drive through very rapidly to, to products in the market. So it, it is about new ways of thinking about how you fund research that, that um, drive, um, that join up the extraordinary discovery base that we have, which is the kind of fuel for the future with um, prosperity and, and public good out in the economy. Um, and then the last thing I, I would like to always bring it back to is people. Uh, and it came up in a variety of places. All of this, in the end, however fabulous your AI is, <laughs> is, is, is dependent on, on people. And I think the people and the skills and where research and innovation sits culturally in our society are all absolutely critical for building this kind of uh, knowledge-led economy that we need. And I think we need to move rapidly away from the idea of the skills pipeline where if you want somebody to, to drive your physics company investment, you need to you know, ensure that in primary schools, people start thinking about physics. We're in an age of uh, very rapid change. Lifelong learning is really important. And um, that connected curriculum, it, it, it's broad, it needs to be broad, balanced, and connected. Royal Society did a brilliant project on this a number of years ago to ensure people are equipped um, as the economy changes to have the kinds of careers we need to drive adoption and diffusion. And that means, back to my core point, I you know, people, I'm not a one thing person because I'm a systems person, but if people ask me for one thing, it is career path diversity. It is how we create a system where multiple very different career paths are supported and encouraged because a huge number of the things we've talked about today um, uh, can be massively um, positively influenced by having people moving, circulating around the system, joining it up, driving adoption and diffusion, spreading skills, creating prosperity right around the country. Well, thank you very much. And um, if I might just add a couple of observations from our work at Resolution. I mean, this is indeed the case as a wider problem of what's happened since the financial crash. It looks as if Britain has done worse than average on productivity and output per hour worked. Uh, but there is a policy trade-off here, and we have done very well on employment and labour force participation. Mm. And faced with a period of slow growth, we have opted for an inclusive labour market with relatively poor pay performance, rather than a more exclusive labour market with lower rates of employment but higher productivity of the workers you've got. And that is clearly um, how Britain has, has operated in the last... 20 years or more. Uh, coming back to the debate we've just had, for me, I'm aware of uh, my own party. I still take the Tory whip in the House of Lords. I'm aware of the oscillations of policy around um, pure research versus near market research. And of course, John Agar's brilliant piece of detective work has shown the shift of thinking during Mrs. T's period in office. Initially, Mrs. T was very keen on applied research. And then she was persuaded that this should be left a business and it, and it wasn't. Uh, and in reality, the role of government was to do upstream research. Uh, and we had another example of that policy cycle recently because it was the 2015, 20, uh, after the end of the coalition, the new, uh, the, the new 
uh, government after the 2015 election, the first budget after that, the then Secretary of State in Bayes, thought near market spend from Innovate UK was not a role of government. So you had a big cut in Innovate UK spend, which Treasury officials said to me afterwards they thought was the worst mistake in the budget. And hence part of what Boris did was to reverse a significant reduction. So there's endless agonising about where, how close to market government should be. Uh, and my experience is that one of America's great advantages is that they carry on with public support much closer to market than we do. And we think there is some cultural issue that they're more willing to take risk but it isn't that. It's their public agencies bear a lot more risk because they carry on funding projects closer to market and we stop earlier and then beat up on ourselves that our business is risk averse. So I'm strongly of the, I think, several of the interventions about how getting, continuing to support things closer to market and investing in things such as scale-up facilities. So after you've got a prototype, getting to half scale before you get to full manufacturing. Those are the kind of areas where public support can really help. But look, this conversation is going to carry on um, and it was a great session. I'm so pleased that Resolution Foundation and FST were able to collaborate on it. Now, if this had been a financial, uh, uh, an FST event, a Foundation for Science and Technology event, we would have adjourned to large rooms in the Royal Society in order to have a drink. There are no such rooms here at this puritanical, <laughs> clean living resolution foundation. Now, there are two options. Over the road, there is the two chairman pub. And the two chairman pub is quite a raucous place. It's where the treasury elite gather. Uh, next week, at the end of the autumn statement, that evening, our keen young researchers will be writing their analysis of the autumn statement, hearing the sound of the treasury officials drinking in the pub outside, having their relaxation. Uh, occasionally, MPC officials are spotted in the sure two chairmen are. as sure. well. Indeed, the very learned debate amongst ec economists as to how do you coordinate fiscal policy and monetary policy, I think the answer is very clear, in the two chairmen. Um, <laughs> but there is slightly further away the blue boar, which is a bit more salubrious, and Gavin uh, it's only about 100 yards or so. And, like, it, it, you turn out here, you turn right, it's straight ahead of you, and you'll see the blue ball. If anybody does wish to have a drink afterwards, Gavin has reserved a area, query room, a yeah. space at the blue ball, and the drinks are on Gavin and the FST. And they're already paid for. Um, so <laughs> that's a really strong incentive. So if anybody wishes to adjourn to the blue ball, you're very welcome. Thank you all very much indeed.